the Harley Benton DC or double cut kit and how to build it. In this video we'll put the entire guitar together using the instructions. However I wouldn't recommend you copying the way I did the body because I did a bit of an experiment and it went completely wrong. Fortunately I managed to rescue it but I still wouldn't recommend you copying it. If you look at the guitar here before I start, you can see around the edges here there's some very deep tooling marks and they're also around the back of the guitar as well. Now unfortunately this means I'm going to have to take quite a lot of wood off to get rid of those if I want to get rid of them. And this is a bit of a problem because what I'll actually do is be stripping off the sealant as well. Uh, you can see these machining marks are also on the side here and everywhere the guitar's been shaped it's got pretty deep machining marks and that just means I'm going to have to remove all the sealing which is a bit of a shame. So what I'll do is I'll start with a block and a piece of wet and dry paper and I'm using a block so that I get the surfaces as flat as possible and I'll start on the front here and initially I can just sand away but once I start to build up sawdust uh, it's wise to stop frequently and brush the sawdust away so you can see what you're doing. This bit speed it up four times and will cut through various sections just so it doesn't get too boring. The reason I'm taking all the sealant off is because if I only take parts off the lacquer or paint will sink in unevenly around the guitar and where there's still sealant it won't sink in at all and where I've stripped the sealant it'll sink in a lot making the finish, the final finish, very patchy. So unfortunately I've got to take all the sealant off. I'll do as much as I can with the block but then I'll put it to one side and I'll just use my hand so I can get into all the fine detail and also so the corners don't end up flattened out and it gives it the organic feel you want from the guitar. You might be thinking, what's the point of them sealing the guitar if I'm going to strip it off again? Well, there's a good reason for this. If you were to be painting the guitar a solid colour, then it really wouldn't matter. You can paint an undercoat on and then you sand that back down and you get a flat surface using undercoat. However, I want to create like a vintage violin look where it looks like uh, old wood and a sort of dark varnish. This, because of this, you'll be able to see the wood coming through the varnish and therefore you'll be able to see the tooling marks. So I need to be able to remove as much of those tooling marks as I can so at least it's not as obvious. When I started thinking about making this video and the look I wanted to achieve, I was looking for a product that everyone could use, even people under 16. And unfortunately here in the UK, if you're under 16 you're not allowed to buy spray paints. I'm also aware that quite a lot of people don't have any decent outside space where they can actually spray anything. And looking around the hardware store this is what I found. And it's an interior varnish that is a dark oak finish and it says it can be either brushed on or put on with a cloth or kitchen roll. So this is what I'm using. And what I'm going to do is put on as many layers as it takes to get the colour I'm looking for. Right, let's cut to the end of the sanding because I think by now you know what I'm trying to achieve and you know what I've got to do. An important warning here, if you're working in the same area as you were working to do the sanding, make sure you get rid of all the dust. You need to hoover up and dust or use a damp cloth to make sure the surface is completely dust free otherwise it'll stick into your varnish. Rather than showing you me putting each layer of varnish on, I'll just show you the, how the guitar looks after each coat, so you can see the development of how it gets darker and more shiny. I'm showing you the first part where I put on the first coat, so you get a good idea of what I'm actually doing. And it's nothing special, just rubbing on the varnish in a thin coat using a kitchen roll. You can see here, 
every time I add another coat, the colour gets a little bit deeper and more rich. Unfortunately, even with loads of coats and using multiple techniques, I couldn't get the smooth finish I was looking for and it was a complete failure. And the only time it was decent, I thought, was after the first couple of coats where it was still like a satin finish. And at this point, I think it would have been quite acceptable. However, this particular product is described as being high gloss. So I thought I could achieve that and obviously I didn't. I did experiment on some pieces of wood and I got the same result, no matter what I did. I don't know if I'm missing something here, or there's some real big flaw in my technique, but I couldn't get a decent finish no matter how hard I try. So honestly, I couldn't recommend this kind of varnish. Now, you might know different, and you might know how to use this product, in which case that's great. Uh, however, because I've not seen it used properly and I've not seen anyone get a decent finish out of this, I couldn't recommend it. Right, I do have a plan. What I'm going to do to try and get a decent finish out of this is to sand down the varnish as smooth as I can get it without going too deep that I'm going to cut down to the wood. And then I'm going to put a couple of coats of lacquer on and that's acrylic lacquer. It would be nice to put on four or five coats, but if I'm completely honest, I just don't have enough lying around. So I'm going to make use of what I've got. The reason I'm using acrylic lacquer is because it's the most available. You can more or less buy it anywhere, and it's the kind of paint you'd use on a car. And another reason I'm using the acrylic lacquer is because I've used the test piece of wood to test it and it doesn't react with the varnish. In fact, it sits really neatly on top of it. In a future video, we'll actually look in far more detail at how to use paints on a guitar. But a very quick warning is that you should always make sure the coats on your guitar match and won't react with each other. Now, if they do, it can be a nightmare and you have to strip it off and start again. So be careful with this, either stick with acrylic or cellulose or an oil base, whatever you're using, the three layers should be the same. And if you're not sure, you just need to do a test like I did, but leave it for at least 24 hours. And here's the finish I've got. And it's not perfect, but it has given it that nice vintage look I was looking for. And considering I was just trying to rescue a really bad job, I think it looks all right. Right, let's put the guitar together. To do this build, I'll be using the instructions. And then if you're following along at home and you've got the instructions there, you can see what I'm doing. So if we turn to the first page that refers to the build, it tells us to start at the headstock with the machine heads or the tuning pegs. The first thing we need to do is take those parts out and lay them out so we know we've got everything we need. And on a guitar like this, we've got two sets of three machine heads. The left-hand sided machine heads and the right-handed machine heads are different. So you can lay those out left and right so you can see them clearly. It's worth noting that they should be numbered L1, L2 up until R6. However, on this particular guitar kit, the numbers were all over the place. But at least you've got the L and R, which stands for left and right. And even if you don't have that clue, it's pretty obvious what size they should go on. Because if you try to put it on the guitar, the holes just won't line up. So if your holes aren't lining up, you need to swap over and then it'll line up perfectly. Right, the other components you'll need to fit the machine heads are six nuts, six washers, and six small screws. So check you've got those before you start. At this stage, you do need to pay very special attention to the sizes of the screws. There's basically five sizes of screws, and it's very easy to confuse the ones that hold on the machine heads. The largest size, there's only four of these, and they're to hold on the neck. 
then you've got a slightly smaller size which are to hold on the strap buttons then a smaller size again which are for the pickups around to hold the plastic pickups around in place and then there's a very small size which there's two very similar sets of screws and one of those sets is to hold on the plates the scratch plates and the back plate and the other ones is the ones we want to hold on the machine heads now the main difference in these is one type is countersunk and the ones that hold on the machine heads aren't and you need to look at these very carefully because they are very similar and make sure you sort out which ones are right but remember there's only six of the machine head screws and this is a big clue whereas there's uh, more for the scratch plates and the back plate saying that for both of the small sizes of screws they've given us a couple of extra I guess just in case we lose any okay then to mount them to the headstock what we have to do first is push the machine heads through the holes and line up the hole for the screw and then just put the screw in and don't put it in all the way and move on to the next one and put them all in and leave them a little bit loose now the reason I don't tighten the screws up at this stage is because the thread on the back of the machine head and the hole and the nut need to align perfectly so we need to put the nuts in first before we tighten up the screws now once you've got them all in you need to turn over the guitar and put the nut in but first you put the washer on because it's important the washer is under the nut so you have to do this for each machine head and again we don't tighten it down all the way because first we have to tighten the screws so now we can tighten up the screws all the way but we don't want to tighten them too tight because remember this is wood and you can potentially strip the hole so just tighten them up until they pinch and the machine head doesn't move around loosely and finally we can turn over the guitar again and tighten up the nuts until they're good and tight and they're holding the machine heads neatly in place and these machine heads actually for such a cheap guitar setup they feel really nice they've got good tension and I can see them holding tune reasonably well but we'll find this out in a bit when we've got the guitar together right let's move on to the next job and according to the instructions we need to make sure that the neck fits neatly in the slot on the body but before we do this I recommend you check you've got the parts you're going to need which are four screws which are the largest screws in the kit and the neck plate right let's check the neck of the guitar with the slot on the body and this is a very tight fit, too tight so I need to sand a little bit off the body so that the neck will fit in more comfortably however when you do this you don't want to do it until the point that the neck's loose you want it to be a neat fit and not a loose fit you'll notice what I always do in my previous videos and that is sand a little then check then sand a little then check and keep doing this if you sand too far you can't put that wood back so only take a very small amount off and then recheck the neck also when you do check the neck make sure you clean all the dust out of the slot because obviously this will affect the size of the slot so make sure the slots clean before you retry the neck and if the neck's very tight whatever you do don't try to force it
Once you're happy that the neck's fitting all right, you need to slide it into place ready for installation. And to do this, you need to line up the holes in the body with the holes in the neck. Now, if you can't see where the holes are, the good idea is to put something smaller through the holes so then you can push it through from one set of holes to the other set of holes and this way you can check the alignment is correct. I'm using a needle file here. Once you're sure you've got the holes lined up you want to put the neck plate in position and then push the screws through and finger tighten them just to make sure everything's held in place before you start to tighten the screws up. By putting the screws in and then just getting them finger tight it means you shouldn't have to align the holes again before you tighten them up properly. Because these screws are very very tight I tighten them up a quarter of the way allow the wood to expand, then tighten them up a bit more, allowing the wood to expand, and so on and so forth. However, if you really find it stiff, you can actually put some butter on the screws, or some water-based lubricant, and this won't do any harm, it'll just make it easier for us to get the screws in, because they're really tight. In fact, these screws are so tight, you might need to enlarge the holes very slightly. But, only do this if you're confident or if you know what you're doing. Once you think you've tightened up the screws, you want to just check the seating of the neck to make sure that the screws are completely tight. And you also just want to check the fitting is correct. You can see here I've still got a bit of masking tape, I just need to get rid of that. But apart from that, the finish is really good and it's a really good fit. Right, that's another job done. And if we look at the next page in the instructions, you'll see we need to start the wiring. And this continues on over the next couple of pages. So before we start this job, we'll do as we've done previously and check we've got all the parts ready to go to do the job. And the parts we're going to need for the next job are a large nut and washer for the switch, slightly smaller one for the jack plug socket and a set of four nut washers and locking washers and there's three spare locking washers and obviously the main part for the electrics is the electrics themselves so let's untangle the wiring loom and lay it all out take your time over this and don't tug and pull at anything because they are fairly fragile and can be broken but we do need to lay them out so we can see them clearly and what belongs where. Unfortunately, with this guitar build, the instructions have been quite scant and they haven't told you in what order to put washers and things like this. However, with the electrics, they're shocking. It just basically tells you to stick things through the holes and tighten it up. It doesn't give you any order and any direction. So, with this part of the instructions, I think Tom and have just been really lazy in putting the instructions together because they're really poor. Bearing this in mind then, here's some tips to help you put the electrics in the guitar and get it right. This is a potentiometer, or POT as they're more commonly known. And we have four of these. Two of them are volume controls and two of them are tone controls. The tone controls are the ones with the green globs attached to them. The green glob is what's called capacitor, and they're the tone controls. The only other two main components in the circuit are pretty obvious, and one is the pickup selector switch, and the second thing is the output jack plug socket. Now all the wires go back to the switch, and coming away from the switch you'll notice there's two separate spurs leading to two potentiometers. On either side. However there is a slight difference. If you look at one side you'll notice the wire connecting the volume to the tone is white and on the other side the wire connecting the volume to the tone is black. 
and this is to help you differentiate between the uh, bridge pickup and the neck pickup. If you take a look at the bridge pickup and the neck pickup, you'll notice one has got a black wire and one has got a white wire. And this is just so you know which pickup plugs into which socket. However, if you plug them in the wrong way around, it's not going to make any difference apart from the fact that the switch will act in the wrong direction. So if you finish the guitar and you find the switch is acting in the wrong direction, just swap the plugs around and you'll be fine. Right, let's start putting the electrics on the guitar. And I'll be doing it in a slightly different order. However, if you prefer, you just simply need to push the earth wire through the hole in the cavity so it comes out on the face of the guitar. I'm going to mount the pickup selector switch first. And you'll notice that on the shaft there's a second nut. And this is to prevent the uh, shaft sticking out too much above the surface of the guitar. However, if you find you can't get the nut on when you've got everything else in place, it means this nut should be tightened down against the body of the switch. To install the pickup selector switch then, we push it through the guitar from the back so you can see the shaft and the switch coming out of the front of the guitar. Then we put the plastic washer on with the positions marked on it, a metal washer and then the nut. As I said earlier, if you find you've not got enough shaft showing, you need to adjust the nut on the other side of the uh, switch accordingly. Make sure that the uh, plastic washer is lined up with the switch directions so that when you switch into the relevant position you can see what it's supposed to be. Some people prefer this upside down so that they can see it looking down on the guitar, others prefer it the right way around. So that's your own customization. you can put it the way you want. The switch and the washer can be fitted in any direction really as long as you're not too rough with the wires at the back. I like to have it the right way up if you're looking at the guitar head on and that's the way I'll be fitting it. I'm just hand tightening the nuts at the moment and I'll tighten them up properly later. So let's put in the potentiometers now. Before attempting to push the pots through the body you need to put one of the locking washers on each one of them. And you'll notice looking at the potentiometers that the earth wire that has to go through the body is coming off the potentiometers with the black wire. Therefore, these two need to be closer to the top and the potentiometers with the white wire need to be in the bottom. Now, once you've pushed them through the hole, you need to hold them in place and turn over the guitar. On the other side of the potentiometers, firstly, you need to put the plain washers on each of the shafts and then you can put the nuts on. Try to support the pots as best you can, because otherwise you can end up pushing them back through the holes. Once the nuts are holding everything in place, we can then tighten them all down, including the one for the pickup selector switch. When tightening up the nuts on the pots, you need to be quite firm when holding them at the back, because you definitely don't want them to spin because if you allow this, you could end up with the wires breaking. And when you tighten up the switch, keep checking the directions the switch is going in and check it's still lining up with the back plate. The next thing we need to do is fit the jack plug socket. And firstly, you need to make sure it's threaded through the hole out of the guitar. And then we mount it to the plate. And we simply push the shaft of the jack plug socket through the plate. Then place a plain washer on. And finally a nut. However, we'll just tighten it up finger tight so that we can align it correctly with the hole. You'll notice here I'm adjusting the nut at the back of the plate so that too much of the jack plug socket isn't sticking out of the front. Mm. 
Next, we need to make sure we can line up the jack plug socket and the two holes in the plate with the two holes for the screws. Once you're happy that the jack plug socket fits neatly in the hole and the two holes in the mounting plate line up with the holes in the body for the screws, then we simply tighten up the nut, put the plate in place on the body and line up the holes then we can put the screws in, the small countersunk screws. Once you're happy, it's all lined up and correct. Tighten down the screws. Right, the next job we need to do is to fit the pickups. And we'll start with the neck pickup. And if you're not sure which is which, the pickups are actually marked on the back with N for neck and B for bridge. So, if you select the one that's marked N, you'll notice the wire is quite long. And that's because we thread it from the neck cavity through to the bridge cavity. And then there's one final hole that runs through to where you connect it up. Once you've threaded the wires, you can place the pickup in place above the holes for the screws and then put the screws in and tighten them up. Just in case this happens to you as well, I had to clear the holes out on the uh, pickups so I decided to then go around all the other holes and clean them out because when I'd done the finish on the body the varnish had covered up the holes. So just by cleaning the openings of the holes with a scalpel knife they were all fine. It's very important with these screws that hold in plastic parts, like the pickup surrounds and the scratch plate, never to over tighten the screws. Because remember, the plastic surrounds will easily break if you over tighten the screws. And all the screws need to do here is just hold everything in place, so they don't need to be tight anyway. Once you're happy that the neck pickup is in place, we can then move on to the bridge pickup and just do more or less exactly the same thing. We just push the wire through into the cavity where it will connect and then we put it in place and line up the four screw holes and then screw it into place. And I'll say again, make sure you don't tighten the screws down too tight on the plastic components because they will crack. And to finish off the electrics, you just need to connect the pickups up. And if you're not sure you've got the correct pickups to the correct potentiometers, you can plug the guitar in and tap the pickups with something metal. And if you can hear them clicking through the amplifier when the pickup switch is in the correct position, then you're good to go. The next job is to store the electrics away neat and tidy. So. We push the wires down so they don't get in the way and we put the cavity plate on making sure we've taken off the protective film first and screw the cavity plate down. Remember not to over tighten but with this back plate you need to make sure that the screws are fully in otherwise you'll catch your clothes on it later. Once you're happy that the back plate is safely into place you can turn the guitar over and then put the scratch plate on the front of the guitar. And I'm clearing the holes out again because I've got varnish in them. And then I'm taking the protective film off the scratch plate because I tend to find if you put the screws in first, you end up with bits of plastic coming out from behind the screws. Once you've got rid of the protective film, you just screw the scratch plate into place. You'll notice I always go around the screws twice and that's because the first times I'll leave the screws loose and then if I have to reposition the scratch plate so it's over the holes it's easy to do. Once I've gone round once and I know all the screws are lined up I can tighten them up then safely. Right I'll just take the protective film off the pickups. Now I'll fit the bridge but before I do I'll bring all the components together so I can check them off the guitar before I bang anything into it and that all seems fine. 
So once I'm happy with the bridge, I can then start banging the parts in. It's a good idea to remove the threaded top half of the bridge column because otherwise you can damage the thread whilst you're banging it in. I'm using a fretting hammer to tap these in. However, you can use any hammer as long as it's not too heavy. And then you use a piece of cloth or cardboard or rubber or something to protect the surface as you're tapping it in. This is a bit of a surprise actually because usually the fretting hammer is too light to get these into place, but they seem to have sunk in really easily. Once they're firmly in place, I'll put the bridge columns back in, and then I'll just put the bridge on top just to check it still fits fine. And that all seems all hunky-dory. Okay, the next job I need to do is to put the control knobs on the pots. And before we do this, we need to turn all the potentiometers either to 10 or to 0. I'll be turning them all up to 10, which means I'll turn the knobs as far as they can go clockwise. Now, because we know all the controls are set to 10, we simply push on the control knobs with the 10 facing upwards and line all the 10s up so that we know the numbers on the control knobs represents an accurate value of where the volume or the tone is. Because I want to give this guitar a vintage look, uh, eventually sometime down the road I might replace these knobs with the vintage looking ones. However, we'll see how we get on and if I like the guitar enough to spend some money on it. The next job we'll do is to put the strap buttons on. And to do this job, we'll need to put aside the two strap buttons, two plastic washers, and the two long screws. And you simply push the screw through the strap button, and then put the plastic washer on, and screw this into place. There's two places where the strap buttons are located, and one is at the end of the guitar, and the other is on the back of the neck. So I'll screw the one on the end of the guitar in first and I've mounted the button and the washer onto the screw and I'll screw them all in together. This is a bit different to the other screws in that you do want it to be tight because if you get any play or any looseness eventually the screw will just come completely loose and your strap will come away and you could potentially break the guitar. So you need to make sure these screws are good and tight. This is where we deviate away from the instructions, and that's because I'm building this guitar for myself. So I'd like to make a change to the guitar to make it better suited to the way I play. Now I'm just going to race through the instructions for this because I realise most of you don't need this. So what I'm going to do is put a Bixby style tremolo on it. You will have noticed as you've gone through this build that I've filled in one of the holes, but one of the holes I haven't filled in and that's because this needs to be my earth connection. For Bixby style tremolos, I use an earthing system as my own design, so I'll show you how I do that now. The first thing I'll do is make a spring using two diameters of rubber piping. The larger one is 10 millimeters, and the smaller one is the standard rubber piping they now use on fender pickups instead of the spring. And the smaller one just happens to fit down inside the 10mm one. So what I'll do with these tubings is cut them one by one. And I'll push one inside the hole to measure the depth of the hole and then cut it to size. And then I'll do exactly the same thing with the next tubing and cut this so it fits in the depth of the hole. And then once I've got the two pieces of tubing of different diameters, I'll push the smaller size inside the larger size, and this gives me a good solid spring. If necessary, you might have to slightly trim the tube again at this point to make sure they're both exactly the same length. If you've got something else that'll do the job, like an actual spring or an eraser or foam, then that's fine. This is just what I've got to hand, and I've found it works really well. 
The next step is to create the contact, which is a brass lub. And I've made this just by cutting a piece of brass bar off. That's exactly 10 millimeters across and just fits in the hole. And once I've cut this off and cleaned off the surface so it will make a good contact, I solder the earth wire to the bottom of it. And there we have it. That fits inside the hole and the spring keeps the tension pushing against the tremolo so it creates a really good earth. Once you finish the earth we can move on to fitting the tremolo. I'll put masking tape all over the part of the guitar I'll be working with and make sure I've marked out correctly where I'm going to put it and where the hole should be drilled. And once I'm absolutely sure that it's where I want it I'll drill the holes and mount the Bixby. You can see here how the earth is pressing up underneath the Bixby, giving a good contact. The last thing I'll do before I finish up is to replace the blade type saddles on the bridge with roller type saddles. And the reason I'm doing this is because of the effects of the tremolo bar. Because you'd be bending the string back and forwards, if the string was resting on a blade, they would potentially wear out quicker and break whereas the rollers will extend the life of the uh, strings. This isn't an essential job, but it's one I like to do, and it just gives me more security when using the guitar. And you don't have to replace the saddles one by one. You can actually buy a complete roller bridge. However, I thought it might be better to use as many of the original components as possible. So therefore, I'm just replacing the saddles with the roller style. Once you've completed this job, You've just got to put the bridge back into place and the guitar build is finished. We now just have to put strings on and set up the guitar. Because this video is probably the longest video I've ever made and I've already made videos on how to put the strings on and how to set up the guitar, you can find those down below in the description. I've also made a page on ebooksforguitar.com where all the videos and information are in one place so you can easily find what you need. As this video could be considered as the continuation of the original video I did, which was a, an unboxing and review of the Harley Benton double cut kit, I'll conclude that now with a few observations I made as I was putting it together. And these observations are certainly worth you knowing if you're thinking about buying one of these guitars. If you watch the original review, you'll remember it was pretty positive. However, I did point out that the body was very light. Now, at the time that didn't seem like an issue, but now I've discovered it is, because the body is very soft. There were places where the screws were going into the guitar, but wouldn't purchase because the wood was that soft. And in fact, I'd be concerned about putting a strap on this guitar, because I feel that the button would eventually be ripped out, and you could potentially break it. I've also found when I was polishing the guitar, I was actually making deep marks in the wood. And that's because if you just press a tiniest bit too hard or bang the guitar slightly, it leaves a mark. And this is because the wood is so soft. Something that's very popular these days and people actually pay extra for is relict or road worn guitars. And if you're into that, this guitar would be perfect because you could easily relic it. In fact, it'll just happen naturally in a very short period. However, if you're proud of your instruments and you don't like marks, you want to steer away from this because it's virtually impossible not to leave marks on it. However, a strange thing is that the neck is ridiculously hard. In fact, I struggled to get the screws into the neck because the wood was that hard. Now, that's a bizarre thing, isn't it? Because we've got the softest body I've probably ever come across and a neck that is probably one of the hardest necks I've come across kind of strange on one guitar but there you go right let's try it out firstly i'll see what effect all the knobs and switches have on the sound
check out what basic rhythmic finger picking and strumming sounds like. Now I'll try stripped of effects. a clean sort of bluesy lead sound. I gain lead. Rock grunge rhythm. I think that's quite comprehensive test, though I'm bound to have missed something for someone. But I found it quite difficult to play because the neck is quite chunky and if I wanted to play it well I'd have to practice on this neck for a long time. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please like and subscribe, I'll be uploading more very similar videos in the near future. And you'll find more great guitar related content on my website www.ebooksforguitar.com and thank you very much for watching.